Welcome back to um, another session on spatial data mining. In the previous videos, you know, we defined what spatial data mining is and what it is not. We gave you examples of common pattern families. We reviewed spatial data input and including implicit relationships. We reviewed spatial statistical foundations. And then we went into the details of different pattern families, such as location prediction, you know, hotspots, as well as spatial outliers. In this video, we are going into the details of spatial co-location patterns. So at the end of this video, we should all understand the difference between spatial co-location patterns and the traditional uh, association rule patterns which are commonly explored in data mining. We should also understand the interest measures of co-location patterns and how they are different from the interest measures for association rules. Okay. So let's first recall what association rules are. If you have taken a course in data mining, you may have come across that. Otherwise, let's take a you know, quick glance and, and review what this notion is. So association rules uh, have a legendary stature in data mining. You know, historically, it started in 1984, as I mentioned in, in your earlier slide, where Walmart was looking at um, you know, identifying item pairs which sell together. Because if they could do that, they could use something called a loss leader strategy by putting one item on sale and making money on the other. It's sort of like you know, when you use your cell phone. Your cell phone hardware is often subsidized heavily. You, you don't pay full price for the cell phone um, itself. But then later on, we all have to buy a plan, the minutes and the data plan, and that's where the company makes up the loss and probably more. Okay? So, uh, so Walmart was essentially looking at these millions of items that they sell and asking which pairs can be you know, um, are bought together so that they could use this strategy. And they concluded that using traditional statistics you know, was not feasible, even though they had 8,000 node computer back in 1984. So they came up with this notion called uh, association rule. So they first defined this notion called support. Okay? So their data sets looks like this market basket data. So you know, customer one comes, and let's say customer one bought socks, diaper, milk, beer, etc. Customer two bought pillow, beer, toothbrush, etc. Customer three bought this, and let's say customer four bought this. Okay? So that's the input data. And the output are pairs. So for example, you know, they might find a pattern call, you know, if people bought diaper, they also bought beer. Okay? And this, we told the story of this. That was one of the in, you know, unusual, interesting pattern that has been talked about in the folklores. Okay? So in order to find this, as I said, Pearson correlation coefficient is very expensive. So they came up with a new interest measure called support. And support for a subset of item like diaper and beer simply is the fraction of transactions in which they occur together. So in this case, if you only look at four transactions, one, two, three, and n, and I ask support for diaper and beer, then you can see it occurs in transaction one and transaction three. So two out of four support is, uh, you know, in this case, we are assuming a five transactions. So two out of five. Okay. Now this support has some very interesting computational property. In, you know, for example, the support for diaper has to be greater than the support for the pair diaper and beer. Okay? Because every transaction that has diaper and beer certainly has diaper. Okay? And because of that, you know, if we wanted to find patterns where support is at least 10%, then you can start with singleton. Just look at individual items, throw away all items which have support less than 10%, and then you make pairs out of remaining item and then you continue on, and I will show you the algorithm. So this was able to scale up very well. Okay? They also had another uh, interest measure called confidence, which is asymmetric. So you can ask, you know, given that diaper is in a transaction, what's the probability of beer being in the same transaction? So in this case, you know, diaper shows up twice, and beer shows up you know, in both of them. So in this data set, this probability is one, two out of two. Okay? So, uh, so these particular interest measure, particularly support, has this very interesting property called monotonicity. In other words, you know, support for beer is greater than or equal to support for beer and diaper. And this goes on for you know, the other set subset relationships. So support for a set is always less than or equal to support for one of its subset. Okay? And because of that, you can do pruning. So let me illustrate that via this common algorithm called a priori. So suppose you know, we have these four transactions. So the first transaction has milk, bread, cookies, and juice, and so on. So there are four transactions. And we want to find out all, let's say, pairs or triples which have support greater than a given threshold. 
Okay. In this case, the threshold is 50 percent. So, at least two transactions should support it. So, in order to process this, this algorithm first starts with singleton. So, there are you know these six different items and for each one we can compute the support. So, it is three out of four, you know two out of four, two out of four and so on. So, 50 percent support means at least two transactions would contain it. Okay. So, looking at this singleton, you can already eliminate couple of them like coffee and eggs. They only occur in one transaction. So, any pair or triple that contains them is not going to occur in two transactions and meet this threshold. So, these two can be thrown away and that is what is shown by the color coding here. So, when we look at the pairs, instead of looking at six choose two pairs, we can only look at four choose two which are the singletons which are qualifying. Okay? So, in the next one we basically make pairs out of those four. So, four choose two you make these six pairs, but notice that none of them involve coffee and egg. Okay? For these pairs again we can compute support and we can write away throw away the pairs you know which have below two. Okay? So, pairs like milk and bread are gone you know we remove them and which is shown by this one. So, essentially three pairs milk cookies, milk juice and then bread cookies survive the other pairs are thrown away right away. Okay? So, when we form triples you can just use these three pairs and in this case they actually use one other property. It turns out that none of these pairs actually share you know enough items. Okay? So, so, you could take milk and cookie and milk and juice and try to make a triple out of it and, and then try to look at its, its support and um, so you know these, these would be the triples and even milk cookie and milk juice you know you could have made milk in, uh, you could have made a triple out of it, but notice that cookie and juice as a pair do not qualify. Okay? So, if there was a pair milk, cookie, juice, there was this triple which could have qualified, then we should have seen juice and cookie, we did not see that. So, even in forming the triple, you do not really have to form the triple. Okay? So, you can use this monotonicity property in multiple ways to prune it and this is a very, very popular and successful algorithm and since then you know many other retailers have tried it. Um, and nowadays there are many other algorithms like frequent pattern trees and so on. Okay? So, this association rule has been a popular uh, paradigm since 90s. Okay? So, now we can ask uh, can we use this paradigm to mine similar patterns in, in geographic data. So, you remember we showed you a map where there were many different geographic features such as dry tree and house, bluebird, fire, green tree and we were asking you which features tend to collocate in space. And now the question is can we apply association rule to mine those pairs. Okay? And the argument you know uh, that we will make is that it is not you know correct or applicable to do so. Even though some people in the early literature did try it. So, let us look at the limitations of association rule. So, first limitation is that you know this whole notion of support and a priori algorithm is built around transactions. Okay? So, support is defined using transactions, you are asking what fractions of transactions contain this particular subset and a priori algorithm uses a property of support which is transaction based. Okay? Now, look at some spatial data, you know for example, here I am showing you a very simple spatial data with three features A, B and C and their instances. So, in this case we can easily find the feature types or item types. I can even ask you which item types co-locate and you might see well A and B seem to be often together B and C together. Okay? But can I apply this association rule mining? In order to apply this I need transactions. Where are the transactions? Okay? They are not there in spatial data which is embedded in a continuous space. Okay? Can we just make up these transactions? And some people did try that and I will show you one approach and then formally you know it is difficult because you know if you create these transactions which are disjoint then you often lose neighborhood relationships which cross two transactions. If you make these transactions overlap, there is a risk of double counting. Okay? But let us look at the first approach that people tried. Okay? So, now we are going back a couple of decades and again same data sets. The first approach was called spatial association rule. You know Professor Jai Wehan who is uh, very prominent in association rule mining has thousands of algorithms for that tried this and what he basically said well let us make up some transactions particularly if you have a reference feature. So, you pick one of the features A, B or C to be very special and then for ins, you know uh, that feature for each instance you draw a circle around it. So, suppose we chose C as the special feature then the circle around C1, circle around C2 gives you transaction. But you can write away notice this approach you know the first transaction will contain C1, B1, second 
C2, B2, but neither of them contains A. So essentially no patterns will contain A. Uh, you know, so in this case actually transactional leading around B might have given you the same result, but in general you have risk of double counting and so on. Okay? So, but using C as the reference feature and these transactions, the only pattern we are going to get is BC, but you are not going to get AB. When you contrast it with cross K function, that is something we saw in the statistical foundation, you will notice that cross K function will find both, you know, AB as well as BC. The cross K function value is 0.5 for both and if, if that is the threshold, both will be searched. Okay. So given this background, you know, uh, we have two choices. Either you can say let's use cross K function, okay? but cross K function computationally is not that interesting. It does not meet that monotonicity property that association rule has. So scaling it from pairs to triples and you know, subsets of four is difficult. Okay? So in this background, a collocation approach was mentioned, which tries to combine the best of the two worlds. Association rule is scalable. It computes things fast. Cross K function gives you statistical sense, right? So we wanted to have a middle ground and that's where spatial collocations come in. So let's try to see how it is defined. So here again, we start with a set of features, A, B, and C in this case and their instances. And uh, the candidate collocations are subsets of features. It could be A, B, A, C, B, C, A, B, C, and so on, okay? In this case, we always start from pair. It's not defined on singleton. Then in terms, in terms of interest measures, we define two notions. The first notion is participation ratio. So you can look at a candidate subset AB and you can ask you know, for a particular feature A, what is the participation ratio? So let's look at this particular example, participation ratio of A in the set AB in this data set. Okay? So it is defined as the fraction of instances of A which, partic you know, which has B in the neighborhood. In other words, fractions of instances of A, which is an instance of the co-location AB. So here there are two instances of A, okay, A1, and A1 has a B in the neighborhood. So does A2, okay. So there are two instances of A, and both of them have B in the neighborhood. So participation ratio of A in AB subset is 2 by 2 or 1. Okay? You can compute it in the you know, other way as well and ask what's the participation ratio for B in the subset AB. Now notice there are two instances of B, B1 and B2. B1 has A nearby, B2 doesn't. So in this case participation ratio is 1 out of 2 or 0.5. Okay? Once we have participation ratio, you can define participation index because ratio was asymmetric and index is symmetric. So we basically take the minimum of two participation ratio to define participation index and in this case you take minimum of 1 and half and it becomes 0.5. So participation index for AB is 0.5. Similarly, you can compute participation index for BC and in this case notice that for participation ratio for B is 1, C is 1 and minimum is 1. Okay? Now participation index has two very interesting properties. The first property is that it has the similar property as support. So computationally, once you find a pair which falls below the threshold for participation index, you can quickly rule it out. You don't need to form triples and subsets of 4 out of it because they are not going to have any higher participation index. So it has this nice computational property which gives you a priori-like algorithm. Okay? But it also has a nice statistical property. It is an upper bound on cross K function. And because of that, you can make statistical sense out of it in terms of the result. Okay? So let's to illustrate the statistical property in a little bit more detail. So here are three examples. Okay? In the first case, you see three instances of A, two instances of B. And if you look at cross K function, in this case, it's two out of, you know, there's, there are six pairs possible, only two pairs are neighbors, it's 0.33. Participation index in this case, you can count in case of B, the participation ratio is one. In case of A, it's two by three. So minimum of two is two by three, okay? You can, you know, compute the other two. I will leave this as an exercise for you. And you will notice that, you know, these are the values and it again illustrates that participation index is an upper bound on cross K function, okay? So if you want to look at the big picture of how collocations are different from association rules, we can look at a couple of different dimensions. First, the underlying space. In association rule, we were looking at market baskets, you know, what each individual customer buys. But in case of collocation, we are looking at continuous geography or maps. Okay? It, the event types in association rule, we are looking at you know, items in a store. Now we are looking at Boolean event types like crime types, 
or disease types and so on. Okay. Uh, in terms of transactions, you know, now we are talk talking about essentially neighborhoods and the interest measures are different. Okay. So, if you go back to the same data sets, you know, where special association rule only found one pattern, cross K function wanted to have two, you know, collocation will find both of these patterns. Okay. So, that is a quick summary. So, let us briefly look at the trends. In terms of the actual trends, you know, there are two basic areas in which work is growing. One is the algorithms. People are looking for scalable algorithms. The initial algorithms were based on spatial join. Again, a connection back to your spatial query language. So, if you have a database which can implement spatial joins well, you can run collocation algorithm leveraging that. Okay. Uh, essentially, for each candidate collocation, one spatial join is computed and that can help you compute the interest measure and you can do thresholding. There are other newer algorithms which do not use join. They essentially take subsets of the data. They sort of mimic transactionizing, but they take into account all the edges which are cut by the transaction. So, the undercounting and double counting is explicitly accounted for and that way they do not make the mistake of association rule. Okay. The second direction is in terms of pattern semantics. So, in particular people have looked at spatiotemporal data where each point comes with also a timestamp and they ask questions like the following. Which types of events co-occur not only in geography but also in time? For example, a lot of people have observed that you know many downtowns you know, particularly on touristy days, uh, bar closing is often followed by minor offenses in the neighborhood, drunk di driving kind of citations further away. Other things people are also looking at are, you know, objects with types which move together. So, if you, you know, watched uh, soccer or American football, you can ask which player types often move together, you know, and some roles in defense and offense, you will find these patterns. Similar things can be observed on the types of vehicles and soldiers in a war field and so on. So, with this let us wrap up the discussions of collocation and association. You know broadly, uh, you know association rule is a popular technique in traditional data mining. However, geographic data is in continuous space, transactions are not natural. So, brute force application of association rule can often lead to erroneous patterns because of undercounting or you know double counting. So, um, and then their results may be very different than what special statistics would, would expect. So, collocation was introduced to take advantage of the strength of both sides. It tries to give you scalability by having an interest measure with monotonicity property that allows scalable algorithm. But at the same time, it has a statistical interpretation. It is an upper bound on the Ripley's cross K function. So, you get the best of both worlds. Okay. So, with this, we will wrap up the discussion of collocation pattern. In the next video, we will try to wrap up the discussion of spatial data mining. Thank you.